Hey guys, what's up? Hope you are having an awesome summer. I'm back to eating sugar again, which is just wonderful. Um, I don't know. It's always fun to do something like that where you like challenge yourself or push yourself. Um, you know, I only did it for like six weeks this time in the past. I've done it for a lot longer, but I feel like it's always, it's always good to see how much self-discipline you have or how much you don't have in my case. And so, um, it was good, but I'm back to drinking and eating sugar, which is awesome because it's been really hot and I was able to have a Coke icy this week, which made my week. So, um, yeah, it's been a good summer. It is flying. I don't know how it is for you guys, but it's been going really fast for me. So I'm excited to jump in today. Um, as we're talking about addiction recovery, we are on step six. And step six is called change of heart. And it's really about just being ready to have God remove your character weaknesses, the things that you're struggling with and be able to change your heart. Um, it was really interesting. So I went to two churches today, I went and visited at different church and then went into my own church. And both times in both places, this principle or this idea of putting off the natural man was brought up. And uh, there's a scripture that was read in my church today that we we're talking about, um, but it talks about, I'm actually going to look it up because I'm not great at quoting scripture, but it's about um, how the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of the Adam and from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, right? So all of us have this natural man tendency, which is to kind of do what we want and live how we want and not put the Lord first in our lives. And so having a change of heart is really about putting God's will before us, like we've talked about in the past and just kind of, you know, doing what he wants us to do. So it's kind of funny. I was thinking about you know, my own natural man tendencies, right? So when I, you know, come home after a long day, you know, my natural man tendency says, you know, I want to sit down, I want to scroll through social media, I want to watch or read something that I want to watch or read. You know, my natural innate nature, my heart isn't first, you know, thinking about like, oh, I should spend some time praying or I should, you know, should spend some time reading my scriptures first, right? Like that's not the natural man for me. <laughs> um, and so I have to put that off, right? I have to say, okay, I'm going to set aside what I want and, you know, set aside those natural man tendencies and do what God wants me to do. And that can be really, really hard because our natural man tendencies um, are, are pretty strong, right? We're born with some pretty innate, strong tendencies that are not always godlike. So I was thinking about this, you know, as far as like having a change of heart. So um, let's say that we have a really bad habit of swearing, right? And we recognize we, we swear too much or we swear all the time. And we know like this isn't really a good thing we should be doing, right? Um, we recognize, you know, when we are swearing and saying that kind of language that that offends the spirit. If we want God's spirit to be able to be with us throughout the day, for us to be able to feel peace, for, for us to be able to hear him and hear his voice in our lives, like we need to be able to, you know, stop swearing as much. And so we have, you know, kind of the first step, which is abstinence, right? We decide we are going to stop swearing. And this can really be with anything, right? We can use this as we're talking about sugar, right? I'm not going to eat sugar anymore. Or we can use this as we're talking about addictions, right? I'm not going to drink anymore, or I am not going to vape anymore. Or I'm not going to smoke weed anymore. Or I'm not going to chew tobacco anymore, right? We can have that first step, which is abstinence. But the desire to do that is still there, right? So we can say, I'm not going to swear anymore, but that desire to swear, um, you know, that natural man tendency is still there. But this step, step six, you know, having that change of heart is really all about asking the Lord to completely change our heart so that we not only don't do that anymore, but that we don't even have the desire to do that anymore. And I'm not there yet. I'm there in some areas of my life and not others, but like, so like, just to, to give you an example on Thursday, I was driving back from Fayetteville into Pea Ridge. I'm on the interstate. There is a semi in one lane, a semi in the uh, semi in the left or the right lane, semi in the middle lane. And then in the left lane where I was driving, I was going like 82 miles an hour. There was this truck with this massive camper that was going 65 miles an hour. And I got stuck behind them. And, you know, luckily I had my daughter with me because my tendency, my natural man tendency, what I wanted to do was honk at him and throw a few choice words in his direction, even though I knew he wasn't going to hear it just because he was being an idiot. Right. He drove literally, I was like stuck behind him for what seemed like 20 miles. It wasn't, it was probably like three um, but like stuck behind this idiot driver that's going 65 on the interstate. And I'm like, I just want to go 80. Um, so my natural tendency, right. Is that I want to swear. I have that desire, that innate desire of, I like, I want to cuss this guy out and tell him what's up. Um, so there's a difference between, you know, abstinence, stopping, doing something, and then not even having the desire. Now, had I been a super awesome, superhuman, 
you know, Christ-like charity person, it wouldn't have bothered me. I'd been like, oh yeah, he's in the fast lane. It's not a big deal. I'm not in a hurry. I didn't really have anywhere to go. You know, it wouldn't have bothered me. That's not my tendency. Probably not yours. Maybe it is, but you know, I just, I was very frustrated, right? That natural bad tendency pops in. So we all have them. Um, but changing our heart, when we're talking about step step six, changing your heart, we're talking about, you know, literally having God change our heart to where we don't have a desire to do evil anymore or don't have a desire to swear anymore or, uh, you know, that, that desire to vape, even though we've stopped vaping or we've stopped drinking or we've stopped eating sugar or whatever it is, right? We don't have that desire, or that tendency anymore. And so really, um, there's a couple of things that help with that change of heart. I think uh, one of the most, you know, helpful things is time. Um, so it was really interesting to me. So I have done the no sugar thing before. Um, I did it for eight months one time. And when I did it for that period of time, when you do no sugar for eight months, um, I really didn't have a desire for sugar anymore. Uh, this time around only doing it for like, I think I did it for six or seven weeks. Um, I still had a desire for sugar. So even though I wasn't eating sugar and I had decided I wasn't going to eat it, I still had the desire for it. Now, like I said, when I did it for eight months, that, over time, that kind of goes away. And so when we're talking about giving up an addiction, right, you still have the desire, even though you're stopping your addiction, that desire to do that is still there. And if you don't want to have that anymore, then a couple things come into play. One, like I mentioned, is time, right? Over time, you kind of lose that desire for your addiction. But the other really powerful thing that doesn't take time is the Savior, Jesus Christ, and recognizing that he has the ability to take that natural man tendency, that desire away. And so just recognizing that and, and knowing that, that the savior really has the power to heal our hearts. So, um, as the, one of the things the lesson says is it talks about how, um, these people, as they're recovering from their addiction, it says, as time passed, we noticed that abstinence seemed to make our character weaknesses more visibly, especially to ourselves. We tried to control our negative thoughts and feelings, but they continued to reappear, threatening our new lives of abstinence. Uh, friends helped us to see that if we wanted not only to avoid our addictions, but actually to lose the des desire to return to them at all, we had to experience this change of heart, right? So it's this idea of not just stopping your addiction, but but having your heart changed to where you don't even have that desire anymore is really, really important. Um, it says that you may realize that you still cling to old ways of reacting to and coping with stresses in life, maybe even more so now that you have let go of your addictions. And I know this is true for a lot of people. So um, a couple of uh, the young men that I had talked to said that, you know, as they're dealing with like regular stuff in their life, like stress or anxiety or, um, just those types of things that they really turned to their addiction. Right. So I, for example, um, more than one young man came to me and said, Hey, like I deal with, um, so one of them, it was anxiety. One of them was anxiety and depression. Like I deal with this stress where I get anxious. And so for them, it was vaping, right. Vaping is my form of, you know, stress relief. So when you take that away, right, you take that unhealthy tool, right? That tool that's not really great um, away. Then you suddenly realize like, oh, I've got to figure out a way how to deal with my insecurities, my fear, my anxiety, and my stress in a healthy way. And it kind of goes back to what I have taught in classes for years about managing your mood and emotions, right? You have to be able to have the tools and understand how to get rid of you know, negative energy in a healthy way and how to restore positive emotions. It's why I harp at that and teach that over and over and over again in my classes and talk so much about it. Because if you don't have those tools, if you do not know how to manage your, your emotions, your anger, your frustration, your fear, your sadness, your anxiety, all of those negative things, then you choose unhealthy, unhealthy patterns, or you go back to unhealthy patterns, right? You can be a hundred percent clean and sober, for a couple of years and then something happens, there's a divorce or a trauma in your life. We've talked about this before and people go back to their addictions and it's not because the desire is still there. It's not because they're still, you know, craving it. It's because something big happens in their life and they don't know how to cope or they don't know how to deal. And so that's why that's important. That's why it's why I talk about it so much when I teach my high school kids. Right. Okay. So it says, as you come unto Jesus Christ, seeking help um, and have patience with the pro the process that you'll have that change of heart, right? It really takes it takes time for that to happen. Um, your resistance to letting go of old patterns of behavior will be will be replaced by an open mind as the spirit gently suggests a better way of living. Um, this was kind of the thing that really stuck out to me from the lesson this week. So um, I had kind of an interesting experience. So normally in a normal basis, when I get ready to, like if I'm assigned to teach a class at church or give a talk at church or teach a youth group or even in my classroom, I try to prepare way, way ahead of time. So if I know that I am teaching a class about money on Monday, I look at it the Monday before, and then I'm thinking about it throughout the week. Um, 
thinking about what experiences I have to share. I, I kind of, for me, my life is busy and crazy and I have to give the spirit time to talk to me. And because my life is busy and crazy, it usually takes a whole week. So a lot of times I will read through um, a lesson ahead of time. And then I kind of think about it throughout the week. I pray about it throughout the week. I read scriptures about it and I kind of have to mull over it for a while. Well, this week, um, I didn't do that. So I knew that I was going to be teaching addiction recovery today. Sunday's kind of become my new day to do that. And I didn't look at the lesson. I didn't even know what the next step was. It's just been one of those crazy summer weeks where everything was happening. And so the first time that I actually looked at this lesson, the step six change of heart was um, today, like this afternoon. And, but it's really, really interesting to me because as I've taught these classes now, we're on, I've taught six steps plus the nicotine one. So seven classes. Um, I'm having experiences in my life and learning things every single week that apply for me. I don't know if it's helping anybody else, but things that I am learning that help me. So I had an interesting experience this week with the whole change of heart thing that I didn't even realize I was going to be talking about. So one of the things um, is that, that I've been dealing with this week that's been kind of tumultuous is money. We've been talking a lot about money and there's been some money things going on in my life. And I was... So I, I mean, I've talked a little bit about this before, but I was born with a really and, and raised with a really messed up set of beliefs about money. And so when I, um, you know, started to like build my own business and started to earn money and started to earn a lot of money, I had a lot of really messed up beliefs about money and things that I had to overcome. Um, like enough that I could talk about out for hours and hours and hours. I won't do that, but just a lot of messed up money beliefs. And anytime you build a business, you make a ton of mistakes. You fell like I failed a million times more. I lost so much more money in the beginning than I ever made. And I had all these ups and downs. Um, one of the things that I've talked about before is I came from a mom and grandmas who were stay at home women. And so even just my beliefs about a woman's ability to earn money um, was really, really messed up. Right. Um, so one of the beliefs that I was born with, it's in my DNA very, very strongly is that, um, this, this idea of, I need to work myself to death to provide for my family. So I come from a long line of workaholics, um, both on my mom's side and on my dad's side, probably more extreme on my dad's side. So my dad is an extreme workaholic. Um, he's better now than he was, but he was a dairy farmer, which as you know, is a lot of hard work. Even if you're not, a, even if you're not a workaholic, which he was, um, he would get up and go milk cows around four 30 in the morning. And then a lot of times he wouldn't get home until 10 or 10 30 or even later, depending on what he was doing or if he was on the tractor somewhere. So I grew up with a dad who was a workaholic. I didn't see him a lot when I was growing up because he worked so much and a grandpa who was a workaholic. But the person that I wanted to tell you about and kind of share with you today is about my, it would be my great grandma. So my grandpa's mother. Um, so her belief and, and the beliefs that, are, that kind of run in my family are that you literally have to work yourself to death. And by death, I mean literal death. Um, so my great grandmother was a workaholic. Um, I'm sure her parents were, I don't know much about them, but I'm sure her parents were too. I'm sure that that was kind of the, the life she was born into. So they were uh, dry farmers in Idaho. So dry farm, if you're not familiar with farming, is basically you go out, you plow, you put the seeds in the ground, and you hope that it rains and that there's water and that the crops grow. Um, there's not any dry farms really anymore in Idaho. That, that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, it kind of went into basically the Snake River runs right through Idaho, and so everybody uses that to, to irrigate. Um, back in the day, it was gravity irrigation. Probably nobody knows what that is, but gravity irrigation and then later like sprinklers and pivots and those types of things. It doesn't rain in Idaho like it does in Arkansas where I now live. And so crops don't really grow. And so you may or may not have had a crop and people struggled and there wasn't a lot of money. And so you really had to work the fields very, very hard to be able to provide for your family and kind of work yourself to death. So my grandmother had, I think it was nine kids. I'd actually have to look it up, but she had a bunch of kids. And when my grandpa was 14, she had a baby. And um, nine days after giving birth to her brand new little baby, um, she decided that she needed to go out and to work into the field, that they needed to be able to do that to survive, to be able to have money to provide for their family. And so she went out after only nine days and began to work in the field again. Um which is to me is insane. I mean, they, you know, doctors tell you, you know, recovery time is minimum six weeks, right? You're supposed to basically like stay in bed or take it easy for six weeks. Um, but at nine days, she decided she couldn't do that. She needed to work to provide for her family. So she went out and worked in the field. Um, she began to hemorrhage 
she began to bleed and she died. She actually bled to death. She literally worked herself to death. Um, so my grandpa at age 14 um, had his mother die, like literally work herself to death and, and, and pass away and die. And it forever affected him and who he would later become in life and, and the type of person he would become and, and just everything about him. It, it, it influenced not only him, but all of his siblings, obviously. So this is in my DNA. Like I am born with this innate desire to work myself to death. And in my business, like I said, as I've, I've built a business, I have realized a lot of these really false, messed up beliefs about money and what you need to do to create money have come up for me. And I've been able to clear a lot of them and overcome a lot of them. But anyway, some, some things happened this week. So on Thursday, my husband has become really good friends with a lady in California. She is, um, an, she was an economics major. She's an investor. Anyway, Thursday night, we were visiting, we were on, she's been teaching us a lot about investing in crypto, cryptocurrency and gold derivatives and all these things. Anyway, we were online, we were watching her. She earned um, $146,000 in the course of about 10 minutes. And it was just this crazy thing. It was really fun to watch. Uh, my husband was really excited for it because he's been working with her a lot. And we've been talking about investing in money. And $146,000 in 10 minutes um, just kind of blew me away. But as I was watching this kind of all go down, like all of this, all of these crap about money, the beliefs that I've had, like started to come back in. And I started to think about all of the times that I have failed in my business, all of the times I've lost money, like all of this stuff started to come up for me. So this was on Thursday night by Friday morning. Like I can just feel it. It's heavy. All of this just messed up ideologically stuff that's going on in my brain about money and about the beliefs that I have around it. So I realized like, this isn't good. <laughs> like I got to clear this. I got to get rid of and, and pass some of this. So um, I went to uh, Cooper Chapel. It's one of my very, very favorite places. And I just hung out for like an hour. I went and just, there's a little path that kind of goes around it. And I went and, and just kind of sat down on a bench. And as I was sitting there, all of this stuff is starting to hit, hit me, right? Fear, anxiety, and all of these, these horrible false money beliefs about who I am and what I can create are like hitting me really, really hard. And I'm feeling it. It's heavy. And so I just kind of said a quick prayer of like, you know, Heavenly Father, help me to clear this, help me to, you know, heal this, you know, heal, heal me, help me to have new beliefs, help me to get rid of this old junk that I'm dealing with. And I kind of did my little clearing thing, you know, I'm thinking about all of these words that start to come up that are negative and not good. And so I'm praying really hard and I could start to feel it move. Like I could just kind of start to feel it release. And I could kind of start to feel like a little bit of just peace kind of sneak in. And I could start to feel like, oh, like God loves me. And it, it kind of cleared for a while. And then I started to think about what I wanted to feel, right? I was getting rid of all of these old icky feelings and all these old false money beliefs that I'd had of fear and anxiety and worry. And, you know, this belief that you, you know, can't earn money simply and easily that you have to, you know, put so much effort in to be able to earn it and all these kind of things. And I just started to kind of notice like these good things coming in. And I started to think about how I wanted to feel and how I wanted to think. And I started to just really feel the love of God as I started to think about new ways about money and about the path that I've been on and about the failures that I've had. Um, I started to think about all of the many times that I had failed in building my business and was just kind of able to let it go of like, you know what? It was a learning experience. It's, it's made me who I am. And to be okay with it, right? To kind of come to peace or come to terms with that and to doing and doing things in a different way, to becoming someone new, to kind of saying, you know, I honor my past, I honor my ancestors and who they were and are and what they did and and the good things that they instilled in me. You know, my ability to work really, really hard is one of the things that I'm the most proud of. But I don't want to have that belief that I have to work so hard that I kill myself. I don't want to have a belief that, you know, and I don't want my kids to have the belief that the only way that they can earn money is, you know, by killing themselves or by breaking their backs. Right. I hope that, you know, they're smarter than the generations before them in the fact that, you know, we can earn money with our brains, right. We can be smart. We can make our money work for us. We can invest. We can make wise decisions. Uh, money can come to us with reasonable effort. We don't have to kill ourselves to be able to provide for our family. And so just trying to shift and trying to change things. And so I started to feel this and was surprised at just that. And I didn't, I mean, I, like I said, I didn't realize I was talking about change of heart today, but just, I literally had kind of a little mini uh, change of heart, a change of belief system and was able to kind of let go of some things that had been holding me up and embrace the new and be like, okay, it's going to be fine. And it was super interesting. It was just like a 360. I went from feeling like this anxiety and this fear and kind of reliving my past mistakes with money. Um, you know, my past messed up beliefs with money and being able to just kind of like wipe the slate clean and be like, okay, like I know what I'm doing. I know what my next step for the next six months, I know where I'm going to be spending my money. I know how I'm going to be investing my money. I know what I'm going to be doing with my money and I'm okay with it. And it's not, 
there's no emotional tie to it. It might work. It might not. I might make money. I might lose money, but it doesn't matter. It's just money. I can always make more. I can always find more money. So anyway, it was just this really cool experience. And then today to sit down and to find out that today we were going to be talking about this change of heart. I was like, I know what that feels like. Cause I literally went through it just a couple of days ago on Friday. And so Um, just recognizing that the Lord really can clear or heal any past crap that we have. You know, if we have a desire to vape or desire to chew, um, we can't overcome that on our own. We can abstain, but to have that desire go away and to completely get rid of it, um, we have to have the savior. That's what the power of the atonement is all about. The atonement cleanses us. The atonement heals us. The, The atonement helps us to put off that natural man And to completely change and to do better and to be different. And so that's what it's all about. Um, So there is a scripture that I really love. It's in Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel 36, 26. And basically the prophet Ezekiel um, is talking to the Lord. And the Lord tells Ezekiel, he says, A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Right? And the Lord is the one that has the power to do that. He can change even like the hardest of hearts and help us to be better. Um. One other quote that I really loved from this lesson, um, and I've read it like four times because I just, this is so powerful. I probably, I need to print it out and hang it up because I love it. But it's by Ezra, Ezra Benson. But he says, the Lord works on us from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums, but Jesus Christ takes the slums out of the people. And then the people take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. But Christ changes men who then change their own environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change even our very human nature. May we be convinced that Jesus is the Christ. May we choose to follow him and change our hearts with him and through him. And I I just love that. Like, I love the idea of um, like Christ really can change us from the inside out. And it doesn't have to be as difficult as we make it. Sometimes it can be about turning it over to him and praying and asking him to change our hearts and to change our nature and to change our desires. And so I really, really loved that. Um, one of the last things that I wanted to talk about before I let you go is um, this idea that if we go to men, if we go to the, to the savior, that he will show us our weaknesses. So there's a scripture that says, if men come into me, I will show them their weaknesses and I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble this, humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. So things that we struggle with, things that we have a hard time with, temptations that we have can become things that we don't even think about. They don't even bother us anymore through the Savior, Jesus Christ, right? If we go to the Savior, he can show us what our weaknesses are. So there's a story in Matthew that I love that I kind of want to leave you with. So it's the story of the rich young ruler. You guys probably, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know the story. But there is a rich young ruler that goes to Jesus and says, you know, how, what, what, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And the Savior tells him, he tells him all the commandments, love thy neighbor and don't commit adultery and, you know, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And he tells him all the commandments. And the rich young ruler says to him, all of these things I've done in my youth, um, what lack I get? And then the savior says, you know, go thy way, sell your belongings, give to the poor. Um, And I love that phrase, what lack I get? And so my challenge for you today, the thing that I I want you to kind of take with you and think about is, is really going before the savior. When you pray and asking what lack I get, what do I need to work on? Because the answer is going to be different for every single person. Every single person that watches this, every single person that reads that story, when they get out on their knees and they pray and they talk to Heavenly Father, the answer for what they lack is going to be completely different. Um, But I think it's super, super important to go before the Lord and say, hey, what do I need to be working on right now? And he can inspire us. He can help us to know what change of heart we need to have. So for some of us, we need to spend, you know, more time in our scriptures for other, uh, for others of us, we need to be, you know, better careful about the music we listen to for others of us. You know, we need to overcome our addictions for some of us. It's, you know, doing better and not swearing so much. It's maybe honoring our parents in a better way. It's treating our siblings kinder, you know, whatever it is, every single person is going to have a different thing that they lack. And And how you know what to work on next is by going to the Lord and asking him, what lack I yet? What do I need to be working on? Where is my heart? 
you know, following those natural man tendencies and where can I change and do better? So that really is my challenge for you guys this week is that as you think about that change of heart, that you really ask the savior, what lack I get, and then work on whatever it is that you feel prompted to work on. And as you do that, praying to have that change of heart so that you don't have that desire to do evil anymore. And I promise you that as you do that, as you ask the Lord to take away the burdens that you have, um, that he will do that, that he will help you, that he will change your very nature, your very heart. I have seen it in my own life. I have seen it um, repeatedly. I still have a ton of natural man tendencies and a ton of things that I am weak on. I have overcome a ton of money beliefs back in the past and recently, and I'm sure I have a buttload more that need to be overcome. But I know that as I turn to the Savior and as I trust him, that my heart can be changed. Those old past beliefs that were handed down to me from my ancestors can be improved upon and can be better for me and for the generations that come after me. So that's my challenge for you this week is to think about your natural man tendencies, to ask the Lord what you lack, and then to ask him to change your heart so that you can be more in tune with those things that he wants you to know and those things that he wants you to hear so you can make good decisions for your life that help you to be happy. Anyway, love you all. I hope you're having an awesome summer and I will talk to you all later. Bye guys.